hello. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. Good. Here we are, digging in with Gardenstead Podcast. And I'm Katie McDonald. I have seen you before, but you may not have seen Aaron before. So I am introducing <laughs> Aaron Deacon from Bios Nutrients. Um, Bios Nutrients is an all organic, um, all natural plant fertilizer that helps mother nature what's your phrase uh helps mother nature basically do her job do her job yeah <laughs> very natural aaron has been a part of our community before he is our resident soil scientist <laughs> and if you've seen him on our youtube we have a whole playlist dedicated to aaron all about info around soil it's called the soil classroom so you can check that out if you want any more information moving forward. Um, but we've got you live. So mm -hmm. I have a whole bunch <laughs> of questions for you. Beautiful. We as gardeners and I know as community members, a lot of the questions that we get, a lot of time that we spend with our members is helping them with pest problems. Yep. And so it's identifying pests, trying to prevent pests. Um, how do you get rid of pests? And so we're going to talk all about critters. Beautiful. Today. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about your business okay, cool. and your product? Yep. Because I think that's a, that will provide us with a good foundation to then answer some specific questions. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds great. So I started learning about basically the effects of synthetic chemicals on soil and water was the big one. So I took a class, an elective in college called Water, A Life and Death scenario I think it was called. So that's when I kind of started researching it more, thought that, that might be an industry to move into. So yeah, when I graduated school, I wanted to start growing and learn a little bit more about that with like hands-on application. So I got a license to produce medicinal cannabis and that's when I really started diving in and researching what plants needed. I kind of went on a journey to find out what grows plants in nature, like why plants grow so healthy in soil without the addition of synthetics or any kind of liquid fertilizers. Um, so that's when I started learning more about super soils and just making your own soil. And then it kind of came down more into biology and that like bacteria and fungi were driving the nutrient cycling of soil and breaking down nutrients for plants to eat. And then that was fascinating to me that there were things in the soil that we can't see, but are actually the drivers a, for a whole growing. little life ecosystem. Yeah, there. it's literally as above, so below. Like it's the same as us on earth here doing mm -hmm. different jobs to sustain life. And that's what's happening in the soil all the time. So that's what kind of got me into it. And then I started making products to basically foster that relationship. So using fermentation to add biology back to soil and plants to start making it alive again and just growing plants with mother nature instead of just trying to like constantly feed the plants and instead of feeding the soil and then the soil feeds the plant and when covid hit i ended up losing my job because it was a food and beverage mm -hmm. industry and that just kind of shot right down so i decided to uh yeah start promoting the fertilizer and smaller bags for house plants because that's what was kind of booming at the time other industries were very competitive and very expensive to get into so house plants seemed like the way to go and uh there wasn't a lot of knowledge in it like a lot of people were getting into growing for the first time so it seemed like a great starting point for education yeah it's, perfect because yeah. throughout COVID, as we know so many new gardeners and you mm -hmm. know younger gardeners got into it yeah um and so they would have been utilizing and you would have been educating them yes pretty much yeah and it's hard like there's a lot of misinformation out there so a lot of people just kind of go with what they hear from people that maybe don't know they the whole story they of should, what's happening. <laughs> they should learn from the blue-eyed scientist, yes. which is what you're called <laughs> by some people. It's yeah. a moniker you're never going to get rid of. Yeah. it's. Uh, I love it, though. It's a nice one. You I'm do have blue eyes. It. I'm staring yes. at them. Yeah. They're lovely. <laughs> but why are you called the blue-eyed scientist? Yeah, so I sent some free samples. Last year, I sent a ton of free samples to people just to try the product. And I knew like once people tried it, they would love it because mm -hmm. of the difference it makes. Um, so I found a guy in the UK named Johnny, the bearded plantaholic on Instagram, if anyone wants to check him out. Um, super funny guy, but he made a series of stories basically on our products once he got them. And he was just mentioning that the blue eyed scientist had sent them these products and they kind of just stuck. Okay. So what do you say we just jump in and help some of our members with their issues? Beautiful. First of all, why do pests happen in the first place? Yeah. So 
could be a variety of reasons. Um, they can happen from bringing in plants from an outside source, from a garden center. A nursery, that's what happened to me. Spider yes. mites all over my house. Yeah, it's tough with nurseries because they're dealing with so many plants and they're coming from usually far away. Like a lot of these plants come from Florida. So there's a huge travel distance that they have to overcome. And so that's a tough one. So yeah, nurseries, um, plant swapping, like with friends is tough too. You don't want to bring plants into your home necessarily. Like even plant shops now are not letting people bring plants in to diagnose because they will get passed in yes. because people don't know what's on their plants. There can be something insignificant to you. You don't even know what it is on your plant, yeah. but you bring it into somebody else's home and it just gets onto their plants. And then they've you got a problem. You say that and now I'm terrified. I picked up an asparagus fern yesterday <laughs> from someone on Facebook Marketplace and I didn't even think. Nurseries, I'm good. I yeah. now quarantine plants away. Yeah. And that was like the biggest one. People were like buying off of Marketplace a lot and yeah. people weren't doing their due diligence on like making sure they were pest free first or even yes. know how to take care of that. Guilty. So it's Shoot. Tough. Guess yeah. what I'm doing the first thing I go home today. <laughs> Taking care of that. <laughs> Taking care of that. Yeah. So that's pretty much how they're introduced into the home or even from you walking outside and like touching plants or brushing up on things and they're going to be on your clothing and you touch your plants when you get home. Super easy way to get pests as well. Um, the, yeah. Okay, so if we don't want pests coming into our house, how do we look at something to determine whether it's riddled with problems? For or sure. Not? Um, so, like in terms of a plant that you're bringing into your home potentially, or what mm -hmm. you already have in your home? Um, are there telltale pest signs that we should be looking for? Yes, just through like observation. So, basically, like, well, yeah, observation in terms of like seeing little spots on your plants, basically, where like something is sucking the chlorophyll from the plant or the sugary substances from the plant that's a great way to know that you have something that's eating your plant so it has it's a little wound that yeah, dot so like is a little wound yeah you'll see it from the top like if you hold it up to sunlight or even without sunlight you'll see kind of like little white spots in between mm -hmm. and that's just because chlorophyll is missing from that so it doesn't have any pigment anymore um, so that's a great way to tell that you have pests otherwise like if the pest is large enough you can just physically see it on the plant itself um, but yeah, and then the other reason why you get pests is because the plant is weakened in some sort of way, either from viral infection or just from not receiving enough nutrients in general. Um, so that's where like our fertilizer and our products make such a big difference because they have the biology within them. To and be preventative. Yeah, so they're basically going to inoculate your soil with the biology and the plant itself if you spray it on it. Plants are covered in microbes just like our skin is. Um, so basically what happens is they're gonna feed the plant everything they need through their entire life cycle. And the more nutrients a plant can get, the more sugar it can produce in its leaves. And insects have an extremely hard time digesting high sugar content. So if they're not getting the nutrients that they need, then that's when your plants become more susceptible to pests and disease right. because they're an easy target basically. So, so give them their nutrients and vitamins yes. so that they can be as strong as possible to not- Fight off basically fight and off. prevent, yep. Okay. In our groups, we get questions about lots of specific pests, but I'm going to go through the kind of top four pests that we deal with with our members. Yeah. Let's start with aphids. Okay. Yes. So aphids. How do you feel about aphids? How do I feel? <laughs> I've never really had them. I've had them more outdoors than I've ever had indoors. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's just because ants will farm aphids on leaves of plants. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, aphids, they're a pain for sure when you have them. They're hard to get rid of, um, especially outdoors because something else is bringing them onto your plant, but they're easy to get rid of, which is nice. And they don't do too, too much damage before you can get rid of them. Okay. Um, unlike spider mites or something like yeah. that. Um, so yeah, for aphids, insecticidal soap is a great one. Um, our yucca extract acts like an insecticidal soap. So my sister and her husband actually own a greenhouse up in Lion's Head and they've been using our yucca extract as a pest control and preventative for aphids because they had a ton of them. And after a couple of weeks, they have no aphids anymore because it basically suffocates and kills them. And once they have something like happening to the earth, something like that happening to them, they generally won't come back because it's not a hospitable environment for them. And Ooh, that's pretty remember. much like any pest. They do remember, yeah. Okay, how about fungus gnats? Yes, so fungus gnats are usually always caused from soil that is too moist. Mm -hmm. Um, so it your can, tropicals, your tropicals are a problem. Yes, tropicals are a problem. Bottom water your tropicals if you're getting fungus gnats a lot yeah. because then the top layer is going to stay dry more often. That's a great way to prevent that. Um, but yeah, it's literally just a factor of watering your plants a little bit less or bottom watering. 
um, if your plants like to be moist a lot of the time. I know even with carnivorous plants, they have to be moist all the time. They can't dry it at all. So it's, uh, you will get them in there. But if you have sticky traps around your house, that's a great way to kind of prevent them because it'll kill the adults. Uh, and then they won't be laying eggs as much anymore. Um, but yeah, keeping that top layer of soil dry is basically the best way to prevent that. But they're not going to damage your plants at all unless it's super young. Like if you have something that's trying to establish itself in soil, then they'll basically eat the roots of the plant and they'll die. But it's more of a nuisance for the homeowners. They're not really going to affect your plants. But yeah. if you want to get rid of them, sticky traps are the best way. And then our fertilizer actually contains a natural larvicide that will basically prevent fungus gnats. It'll kind of kill the larvae. Um, other than that, you can use diatomaceous earth as a great one, sprinkle it on top of your soil and when the larvae hatch, they will basically breach the top of the soil. They'll get covered with the diatomaceous earth, which is just like a white powder, and they'll just die immediately. So, but yeah, they're, yeah, just more of a nuisance than anything. Okay, that's good. But the next one is not just a nuisance, thrips. Thrips, yes. Thrips are brutal. Uh, we don't like thrips. Thrips and spider mites are extremely hard to get rid of. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I would do the yuca extract for sure for that, or a mixture of like that and neem oil is great too, uh, because neem oil is effective when it has something to help it stick to the leaves, um, but you don't want to use it over and over again because pests will become resistant to it, especially thrips or anything like that. Um, so some form of integrated pest management is great. So spraying your plants every two weeks with let's say a yuca extract one week, and then two Insect weeks later, soap. yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, so you can make an insecticidal soap at home. If you do make an insecticidal soap, um, you can actually use our yuca extract as the soap component to it. So you can add that into the water and then add oil. So basically olive oil. So, so it sticks. Exactly, yeah. And it basically like coats the insect well. Um, so easy recipes, a liter of water, half a tablespoon of olive oil, and then a few drops of our yuca extract and shake that up. And then you just want to make sure that the yummy yeah <laughs> and uh, you want to make sure the oil is emulsified so if you yeah. shake it and there's a layer of oil floating to the top just add a bit more yuca extract until it's fully dissolved in the water just like a balsamic vinegar or a vinaigrette i guess i was just be. gonna say don't mix it up with your salad dressing no don't yeah. put it in the fridge <laughs> you could it's completely safe to consume but <laughs> all human safe which is great but uh yeah that's a great way to do it the pest management control but yeah insecticidal soaps are They'll be effective on literally any house pest that you have. Right. Yeah. And if you have a current infestation, spray every every two to three days, three days at minimum. Um, and that'll basically cut off the breeding cycle. cycle. Yeah, yeah, exactly, of the pest. And once you don't have them coming back anymore after about a week or two, then just do bi-weekly sprays after that to prevent them. Okay. Yeah. So bi-weekly sprays and also BIOS. Keep yes. using BIOS. Yeah. fertilizer to 100%. keep the plant healthy enough yes absolutely yeah if right. you keep using bios like your soil is going to become healthy enough that it's going to in turn make your plant healthy enough to actually fight off these pests themselves so mm -hmm. they've done studies where like if the bricks level is one thing um, the sugar content of leaves and we talked about that a yeah. bit before um, but you can measure the sugar content in leaves and once it hits a certain level insects will basically latch onto them start trying to chew on them or eat them and they'll just like fall off because sometimes the high sugar content can like get them intoxicated um, or it can be like a stomach upset so they just like won't bother your plants anymore intoxicated yes bugs yeah <laughs> Yay. um okay we're focusing on <clears throat> pests obviously for this podcast but yep. we do have some more general questions that our community has asked that we think you'd be the right person to help them deal with awesome so what's the difference between good bacteria and bad bacteria? Yes, so yeah, it's a pretty fine line. You need both in soil and on plants to actually have a healthy ecosystem. You don't want to focus too much on the good ones because it can actually throw off the balance. Yes. Um, so that's something to watch out for. Like with our products, we focus on diversity more than anything because you need such a high diversity on plants and in soil for that ecosystem to actually function. If you add too much of the good ones or like too narrow of a variety of good ones, then- It offsets. Yeah, it just messes things up and like yeah. the bad ones can actually start to take over and do more damage than good. Um, so it's tough. Um, bad ones will generally create like disease spots on your leaves. Um, so they'd be like physically within the leaf, whereas like a fungal disease will most likely be on top, on top. of the leaf itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So brown spots on leaves, brown spots on stems. Yeah, like brown and black spots on leaves mm -hmm. can generally be a sign of a bacterial infection, sometimes a virus as well. 
Um, but yeah, so it's, you can basically just kind of cure it from adding beneficial bacteria to both your soil and the leaves, which is what our probiotic is great for, mm -hmm. um, because you can use that as a foliar or soil drench, and that's basically gonna coat the roots of the plants because bacterial infections will get on the roots as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're basically adding good ones to fight off the bad ones or kind of like keep them in check. So it's always just like a constant balance that the soil is trying to maintain. And if you can just kind of keep feeding the soil with something beneficial that has a lot of variety yeah. to that, then it's going to always keep that culture in check. So, so your probiotic that you produce, <clears throat> how frequently should you use that? I wake up in the morning and I have my probiotic every morning. Yeah, Do my sure. plants need their probiotic every day? They don't need to. And like, I, I don't know if humans do as well, because like we have such a big ecosystem in our bodies that like it's more so just like maintaining, like even the foods that we eat is maintaining that's kind of the feed the soil, feed the plant kind of thing. Where like, if you're feeding it properly, then like, yeah. it, it will need all, any extra. Yeah, area. like certain foods will like promote the growth of certain bacteria and fungi and beneficial ones over others. Um, but yeah, I would do it like once a week is more than enough. I usually recommend people like once every other week, um, mm -hmm. just because like, if you're using BIOS, if you're using the probiotic often, then you're constantly giving back to that soil, and that's actually feeding the microbes. So. They're constantly multiplying, they're staying healthy. So it's kind of like a little top up for them just yeah. to keep it healthy as well as the sugar content and the probiotic will basically feed the microbes, okay. which kind of comes back to feeding the soil again. Feeding the soil, healthy feeding soil, the soil is key. it always yep. comes back to that. What does a fungal disease look like? Yes, so fungal disease on the plant will look like a mildew usually. So like there'll be a powdery mildew or a rust mildew or pretty common ones for indoors. And they're usually from a lack of airflow. Um, plants need airflow, like a gentle breeze, just like here, is constantly moving moist air out of the plant because when plants transpire, they're transpiring water and moisture. So without the proper airflow to take that humid air away, it'll start building up molds and mildews. Um, because mold spores or fungal spores are the most dominant like particulate in our air, so we're breathing them every single day. They're on everything we touch, they're on our bodies. Um, so when there's a moist environment, they will basically Thrive. culture themselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, so you'll notice there's like a white powder on the leaves. That'll be a powdery mildew. Rust mildew will be like a brown or dark kind of like covering on the leaves. But it'll always be like you'll be able to wipe, you can it, wipe off. it off. Yeah, exactly. Not sticky. Um, no, and some will live within the tissues of the plant, but they're generally there for a benefit, not so much a harm. Um, most of the harmful fungal disease will be on the plant itself. Um, and then in your soil, you can get fungal disease in the soil as well um, from... Yeah, a variety of different reasons. Like if the soil is not healthy, if it goes anaerobic, you're gonna be basically producing bad fungal diseases and bacterial diseases. Um, and that'll just kind of show itself in like the health of the plants. It'll just start looking kind of droopy or dying off, um, but it won't have like any physical signs on the leaves for the most part. Sometimes like it will because it's not receiving nutrients anymore. Um, but yeah, for the most part, fungal diseases are gonna live within the soil, so they're hard to see. So it's kind of like on us to make sure that we're keeping the soil healthy, that there is life within it, because that's kind of the biggest thing. If there's no life within your soil, it's not going to control any kind of fungal disease. Uh, but yeah, you can usually see sometimes different fungal growth show up in soil. It can be different colorations. Sometimes it'll be yellow. Um, yellow stinkhorn fungus will basically grow up the stem of your plants. Um, so it'll be like a slimy yellow substance that starts kind of from the soil and goes up the base of the plants and that'll rot your stem away and your plant will die that sounds terrible i haven't seen that before mm -hmm. yeah i've never had it i've had like the type of fungi in my soil yes. if it's super moist you can sometimes see like a yellow growth in the soil or little like dots um, but as long as it's not growing up your stem it's completely harmless and uh yeah for the most part fungi is beneficial for soil and plants yep there you go um, I have a question for you coming out of that, which was about you said when your soil goes anaerobic. Yes. So I know what that is because I went to <laughs> um, biology classes yep. during university, but I don't think everybody would know what that necessarily means. Yes. So, so what is that? Yeah, anaerobic is basically the lack of oxygen. Um, so when you overwater a growing medium, there's no oxygen in it anymore. Like oxygen will be in water, but it will dissipate very quickly over the course of like 12 hours. So if there's too much water, there's no oxygen flowing into that soil anymore and roots need oxygen to survive. Uh, and what happens basically is that anaerobic fermentations like alcohol, for example, they will basically produce alcohol from sugars in the soil. 
Um, so you'll start getting like ethanol production in your soil, which is going to kill the roots of the plant right. and just like proliferate disease. Um, so yeah, anaerobic's tough because like we use anaerobic fermentation to make our products. Mm -hmm. It's just that we start off with specific beneficial microbes to make sure that no harmful pathogens are getting take in over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, same with like growing mushrooms. It's an anaerobic process for the culturing of it. Mm -hmm. um, we need to make sure it's super sterile to make it happen properly. Mm -hmm. But so yeah, anaerobic is just the absence of oxygen and then aerobic is the presence of oxygen. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Soil scientist, Aaron Deacon. <laughs> so maybe let's give our Gardenstead audience some hope. Yep. They've listened to all of the bad bugs, all of the bad things we should be watching out for. Mm -hmm. But is there one, th if somebody's going to remember one thing, what's the one thing they should remember to do to to try and prevent this from even becoming something they have to deal with? For sure. I would say one thing is tough because there's so many things about it. One, just <laughs> one, one. thing, just one thing. Um, I would, I would do integrated pest management. Mm -hmm. That's the best thing for sure because, like, even with healthy soil and it's making your plants more pest resistant, like you're still gonna have to do some form of maintenance Triage. on your plants. Like you're never gonna get away just no maintenance at all on your plants ever. It's just not realistic mm -hmm. um, because, like specific parts of your plant can actually have less sugar content than other parts of your plant. So one part might be more susceptible while others will be no problem. So yeah, I would spray your plants every two weeks with some form of insecticidal, insecticidal soap, soap or our uke extract is an amazing alternative to that. It's super easy. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, integrated pest management every two weeks have some form of, and don't do the same thing every time as well, like the okay. two weeks because plants like they'll get will, used to it exactly yeah insecticidal soap is pretty bulletproof because it just coats them and suffocates them they're never going to get susceptible to that in case they evolve very quickly but mm. um yeah you can add like different essential oils too so one week you can do an insecticidal soap with peppermint oil the next two weeks you can do it with cinnamon oil um so kind of have a variety and you can play with it a little bit so insecticidal soaps every two weeks play around with adding some essential oils into that as well and you'll be good to go so Aaron, you clearly know so much about all of this stuff. I know you have a very educational Instagram feed. You're great yes, in, in trying you. to really spread this message. For sure. So give yourself a little plug. Awesome. How can Sweet. everyone get some more information from you? Yes. So you can learn a ton more about all of this on our Instagram. It's at BIOS Nutrients. Um, I try and put a bunch of information on our website as well, which is biosnutrients.ca or .com if you're in the U.S. Um, and that's mostly where we do it. We're trying to do more long form on YouTube as well because I can find, like I can give a lot more yeah. depth to the conversation yeah. because it is so, it's hard to get all this information out in a 30 second clip of yeah. like why bacteria is important and what it does for plants. Um, so yeah, our Instagram is the best way to find out more. Um, and then you can call me anytime too. My phone number is on our Instagram and I'm always happy to chat about soil and plants and how to help you out. So. Yeah, that's where you can find us. And if you want to try BIOS, our all natural plant fertilizer, we have free samples available on our website. Um, it's free plus shipping. So all you have to do is pay for postage for the envelope and you can get free samples of our fertilizer right at your door and try it for yourself. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to do all we can to support Aaron in his um, mission to educate people around soil health. And so we'll be adding to a playlist on our YouTube um coming up with more info from aaron and i think we'll probably have to have you back just yeah, to I'd help to. us keep our plans healthy beautiful i'd love to <laughs> thank you awesome thanks katie awesome